السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله So for those of you who may remember last time we were talking about uh, your personal spiritual service and that was uh, from hadith number 19 from Jamia al-Ulum wal-Hikam by Ibn Rajab rahimahullah and we were generally following the same structure just summarizing the explanation adding some more some other examples analogies and case studies and so on and so forth so what I'm trying to do is kind of pick hadith that are very relevant to based on some of the interaction with different people that I have uh, in, the, in the coaching setting. And uh, today we'll be talking about hadith number 24. And this is from Sahih Muslim. And the highlight for today's uh, lecture or lesson or discussion would be the number one issue that damages relationships and is not paid attention to. Second thing would be uh, preparing medicine for mental and emotional exhaustions. Thirdly, we'll be discussing overburdening yourself by not realizing what is your responsibility and what is not. Fourthly, we'll also touch base on solution to hasad, jealousy. Fifthly, what really matters and enjoying the journey and destination versus the rest stops. So inshallah, all this will be covered uh, in the discussion of this hadith, which is hadith number 24 uh, in that collection. So we'll just take parts of the hadith, explain, discuss, uh, look at some of the examples, action points, benefit, and keep moving on bismillah. So this is narrated by Abi Dhar radiallahu an, that he's, he reported that from the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which he is quoting from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a hadith Qudsi, right? And so Allah's Messenger says, quoting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya ibadi inni harramtu al-dhulma ala nafsi wa ja'altuhu baynakum muharraman fala tadhalamin. O oh my servants, I have made oppression, the dhulm, unlawful for me. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it prohibited for himself and he had made it unlawful amongst you as well. So do not commit oppression against one another. So that's the beginning of the hadith. We'll talk about that and then we'll move forward. So firstly, what is a dhulm, right? What, it, what comes to mind when we think about dhulm, wronging someone, oppression, transgression. So any ideas what is a dhulm? Definition or even example? Biggest dhulm is shirk, definitely, right? And so what is a dhulm? Okay. No, yes. So this is how, how the scholars have defined it, that dhulm is to not give something as true right, not put the things at appropriate places, you know, saying something to wrong person or at an inappropriate time and so on and so forth. And the brother mentioned a very good point that it's also related to dark messages, right? And this is not just a literal similarity but in fact we know from the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that oppression will become darknesses on the day of judgment. Good. So so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from a from an ability perspective uh, he is able to but from his completeness and his sifat perspective this is not something that he does. He does not wrong anyone. And, and there's many verses in Quran that talks about that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not the one who wrongs at all. One of them is Surah Yunus, verse number 44. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Allah la yadlimun nasa shay'a. Truly, Allah wrongs mankind, not at all, like not to a single level, right? So this is something that has been talked about in various places in Quran. So what does that mean now? So because if you take a look at it from a, from our understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right, this is very important. Number one is that your good deeds will not be wasted. So if you do something for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will not wrong you, right? If you leave something for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it does not befit the majesty, the mercy, the kindness, the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he does not replace that for you. So if you leave a job that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not like, if you leave a friendship, if you leave a profession, if you leave an opportunity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not like, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is not possible that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not replace that for you. 
So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises something on some action of yours, and you do that action, it's not possible that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not give you that. The last time we were discussing about your personal secret service, how you can have your own personalized protection. And there are some promises that we were looking at that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made. So if you were to fulfill your part of the promise, it's not possible that Allah will not fulfill his part of the promise. Likewise, think about this. So the most important matter, as we also discussed last time, is the five daily obligatory prayers, right? So it's not possible that we come and we leave our worries and our concerns and we put it in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we engage in a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not possible for that meeting, that conversation, that prayer with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to go to waste, right? Because we would not expect that from any other human being. So if you go to a generous human being and for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the highest example and you put your concerns with him, you have a chat with him, you have a discussion with him. Firstly, he would give you some food, some drink, tea, coffee, whatever, according to his means, right? And then he would provide value for you by his advice, by his connection, by giving you tips and what so on and so forth. So how can it be that we go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taking our concerns of this dunya as well as, a, as well as our concerns of the akhirah and we come back empty handed. Likewise, us making dua for any problem, even though we may not see the results right away, it's not possible that it has no effect. And so on and so forth. Okay. Now, another angle to that, as I was saying earlier, a lot of when you take a look at some of the coaching sessions, intervention sessions, a lot of times there's a lot of damage that has been done, right? So let me go on a quick tangent here. So what typically happens if you look at the society and you, you take a, if you categorize people in three categories, they are top performers, right? So top performers in their businesses, uh, in athletics, in sports, right? And most of the time you would see a top performer always would have a coach, a mentor, would be reading new ideas, would be trying new things, would be very active in becoming better and better, right? Now, on the other hand, you have somebody who's like really bottom, has hit the rock bottom, doesn't know what to do now, and has really damaged either relationships or business or what have you, then they would reach out for some sort of a professional help or getting advice from somebody who have expertise. And then you have a wide spectrum in which the people are in the mid middle category in which some of the things may not be going so well, but they would think that getting help is sort of limiting them as if they're not good enough and so on and so forth. Although that may not be the case because we see that top performers also get help, right? And we know from our deen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ So if there's a problem, there's a situation, you don't know an answer for, you need a, se you need a second eyes, you need a second pair of eyes to help take a look at some of the blind spots, there's nothing wrong with that. Likewise, we see in uh, other, s other situations, like if there's a dispute between a couple, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has it in Quran to have you know, mediators and so on and so forth. Now, what would happen is sometimes when things become really, really bad and you're having a discussion at that point, there's a lot of loss that has happened from a worldly perspective and people are thinking, okay, what about all those years of suffering that I've gone through? Right? So even if I forgive today and I move on, what about everything that has already happened? So again, this thing reminds us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not oppress you. So if you have suffered, Allah will recompense you. Whether it be in this life, you know, future, so on and so forth. So something to think about. And there's many different ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala compensates. Okay. Now the second angle of that is between the human beings themselves. Right? So if you take a look at some of the narration from the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how careful they used to be. So someone would discipline their slave and would punish them or hit them or something, and then he would be concerned that, have I oppressed him? Have I punished him more than what he deserved? And they would go to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they would hear about the cause and the consequences of oppression and they would ending up freeing the slave and that's a big deal like you're just like you're like okay fine you just you're freed just because of that single disciplinary action just so that they don't they're not risking themselves to be accountable on the day of judgment now this is something that happens pretty much everywhere right and something for us to reflect and think about where am i be oppressing someone else so it's important to think that how can i oppress because if you don't understand 
what comes under oppression, then they might be thinking, oh, I'm not oppressing anyone. So let's take a look at some of the ways that people oppress each other. So there are some common ways, you know, you take somebody's money, you, you make a promise and you don't do that. So these are very clear, clear cut, right? But then there are very subtle points as well that people overlook. So what can be some of the subtle points where people oppress each other? right so think about your your friend that you don't like how would he be oppressing you Backbiting. sorry backbiting okay very good right so that that's very common but also sort of people realize that like it's not something that is very hidden so that's a good one and it's a very common one as well okay where else do you oppress bad thoughts. one okay so having bad thoughts okay that is also very important right because if you have bad thought you think that somebody is bad has al alternative motives or does not have good intentions for you, the way you would treat them, the, wo the way you would talk to them, and it comes, right? A good way to actually, that's a very good point, a good way to check your run about someone is how you react, what kind of words and thoughts come about some person. And if it's not something that you would like to you know, speak out loud, that means there's something inside that's causing those words and thoughts to come out. Okay, what else? Heresy, okay. Let's, let's try to see more subtle points, right? So, for example, not spending time, right? The husband not spending enough time with parents or with wife or with children and spending a huge amount of time on his business or in his career uh, or with his friends or even for volunteering, right? So, e obviously, every family, every situation is different, but if, if there's a complaint, clear complaint that, hey, I'm not getting enough time, and a wide majority of that time is going on with friends or volunteering or whatever, then that's an issue, right? So that's one balanced issue, right, which is work, right? How would we know that? How would you come to that if, if we start paying attention, if we start listening, and if we start asking people that we are responsible for that, hey, mom, hey, did I, am I giving you enough time? You know, is there something I can do for you? Is there something that you need from me? Likewise, from a spouse, from children, paying attention that, you know, just not taking things for granted, asking and evaluating. Other forms of oppression could be for the self as well, right? So, you know, saying yes to too many projects, saying yes to too many invitations and not having time either for private worship or for personal health or, you know, working out or eating properly or just not having enough time, just being so stressed and so uh, uh, under stress and overworked just because you're saying yes to everything. Other forms would be, you know, commenting on other people, judging other people, right? You are lazy, you're not good enough, you're always late. When we use these words like always, right? They have huge impact on the listener, right? Sometimes we think, okay, it's not a big deal. And it may not be a big deal among some friends, but when you say the same thing with family, it becomes a big deal, right? Or, or just not using polite words. So a lot of time you would see, if you just start observing people in customer service, you know, you go to a car dealership, you go to an airline ticket reservation system, whatever, even hospitals, a lot of people are generally and genuinely very nice. You know, they say, thank you, please. And if they if they can't do something, they would apologize, right? And we have this in Surah as well, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if you're not able to provide them financially, you use appropriate words of kindness, you use nice words, right? And this is something that we miss out a lot, right? Especially with family, children, what have you, when we want to say no to them, we wouldn't use kind words, hey, you know what, I understand I really want to do it for you, but I can't have to go to work or I have to do something. Just that changes the whole tone and the whole situation. So the point is that it's a very wide term and we need to think about where else can it be going wrong. And I'm sure that everyone can find places where they can improve that. Okay, likewise from the perspective that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not do zulm is that Allah will not burden someone for someone else's sins, right? And this is something that people have different concept about the sins because sometimes a test is coming and they would think, oh, this is because of my sin. Or more importantly, uh, from a perspective of one, they would say, oh, this is happening to me because of you, right? So that's a big thing, like people actually say these things, right? Or saying, oh, this happened to you because of your sins. Like you're making something about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah is punishing you for your sins that's why you broke your arm or you know the car broke down. Now you're even not talking about yourself, but you're talking about somebody else and, and people do that. So may Allah protect us from that. 
So the point being, now you have this information, and we talked about it last time as well, is for us to now take that and make it practical. Meaning that if anytime we are having some thoughts that are demotivating us or that are causing us grief or anxiety or depression, so something to think about is that, is it related to this principle that we have learned today? Or the last or, or the principles we learned last time. So today we learned that okay, Allah will not wrong me. So yes, I, I had painful situation in the past and I went through it, and Allah will recompense me for that. Okay. The second thing is if I put in the effort, some people don't put in the effort because they think that success cannot come, or I'm not good enough to do it, so why even try? So that would not be appropriate because if you are making dua and you're trying, and this will come further in the next part of the hadith as well, if you're trying, it's not possible that Allah will not recompense you. So the point is that to be aware of those thoughts that are limiting us and then to you know, fight them back with actual text, actual promise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right, so now clear, uh, wrapping up on that point, obviously the number one form of wulm which we do um, um, to ourselves is to commit shirk. Right? To associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then the major sins that we do and then the minor sins that we do. This is all oppression against ourselves. We cannot oppress Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is our own oppression to our own uh, nafs. Now finally, to, to, uh, to make the point that why it's very important to evaluate ourselves, are we doing wulm to someone? And to ask, to ask our family members, to ask the people that we are responsible for, right? That are we doing wulm? Or not? I mean, are we? Uh, am I performing my part of the contract? Am I performing my responsibilities? Am I performing my responsibilities on time, and so on and so forth? So think about this thing. So some of you are aware of Bitcoin, okay? Or real estate market? What's happening in Toronto last year, right? So last year, Bitcoin was around. I'm not saying it's halal haram. It's just nothing to do with that. So Bitcoin was around thousand dollars last year, right? Today is ten thousand dollars. So if somebody is stole one Bitcoin from me last year, and today he wants to repent, or I take him to court, how much he has to give me now? $10,000, right? So he just stole like, you know, th that year it was only $1,000, but now to for him to buy the same Bitcoin, he has to invest $10,000 and then give it to me because if I insist on getting the Bitcoin back. Same thing, let's say someone cheated me and took a hold of m one of my condos, right? Like if I have many. So and then now he did that, let's say in 2010, and I take him to court in 2016, big difference, right? It's not the same. Now think about this. So the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying that Man kanat indahu mudlamatun li akhi, falyatahallalhu minha fa innahu laysa thamma dinara wala darham min qabli an yukhada li akhihi min hasanati. Fa illam yakullahu hasanat, akhada min sayyati akhi. So Allah's Messenger وسلم, is telling us, advising us that if somebody has wronged his brother, he should ask for his pardon before his death. Right? Because in the hereafter, the currency is not same. You cannot repay now with that thousand dollars or two thousand dollars or what have you because now you have to start using your good deed and bad deed. So it's like worth a lot. You don't want to be losing your good deed or taking on his bad deed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so that's the thing. So that's why I wanted to bring that analogy. So hopefully we can realize that it's, it becomes much bigger. So it's very important to take care of it right now. Okay, so that's that part. Now we continue on with the hadith, and the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is continuing to quote and narrate from Allah subhanahu wa taala in this hadith Qudsi. He says, "Ya ibadi, kullukum dal illa man hadaytu, fastahduni ahdikum." يا عبادي كلكم جائع إلا من أطعمت فاستطعموني أطعمكم يا عبادي كلكم عار إلا من كسوت فاستكسوني أكسكم يا عبادي إنكم تخطئون بالليل والنهار وأنا أغفر الذنوب جميعا فاستغفروني أغفر لكم So all my servants, all of you are liable or prone to making error and in misguidance except the one who I guide the one that who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides. So what? So ask me for guidance and I will guide you. Oh my servants, all of you are hungry, needy, except the one who I feed. So ask me for food and I will feed you. Oh my servants, all of you are naked, needing clothes, except the one for whom I provide, guidance, uh, gu I provide garments. 
So that cloth from me, ask cloth from me, and I will clothe you. Oh, my servant, you commit sins and errors night and day, and I am there to pardon your sins. So beg pardon from me, and I should grant you pardon. I should grant you forgiveness. So, again, very powerful. It has a lot of consequences. Number one is guidance. So guidance is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? That's the foundational principle. So if we want guidance from ourselves, and last time we talked about on the importance of being steadfast on guidance because it's not a, gra- gra- it's not a thing to be taken for granted. You may have it today and you may not die upon guidance. May Allah protect us from it. So if I really care about that, then I'll be asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance. And I'll be pay- paying attention in my salah and all my other forms to make sure that I take it and ask and I beg it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, for the children, right? We do a lot of different things. You know, schooling, which school, which madrasa, which teachers, friends, this and that. But the most important thing, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us to, is to ask Him. So if our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is intact, it's not being damaged, and I'm asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's the strongest means and the strongest sabab for me to get guidance for my children as well. And again, when you think about the dua, you're also thinking about things that prevent the dua from being accepted, such as our sins and eating and you know, haram and so on and so forth. So again, you have many verses in the Quran that reinforces that, such as in Surah Al-Kahf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَن يَهْدِهِ مَن يَهْدِ اللَّهُ فَهُوَ الْمُهْتَدْ وَمَن يُدْلِلْ فَلَن تَجِدَ لَهُ وَلِيًّا مُرْشِدًا Whoever Allah guides, then He is the one who is actually guided. And the one who Allah lets you go astray, the one who Allah does not guide, then you will not find for Him any wali, any guidance. So that's very important. Okay, now... Continuing on that bigger part of the hadith, there's a, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying about hunger, clothing, food. So any benefit, anything, any worldly need that we have, it is only going to be facilitated from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Fatir, verse number two, مَا يَفْتَحِ اللَّهُ لِلنَّاسِ مِن رَحْمَةٍ فَلَا مُمْسِكَ لَهَا وَمَا يُمْسِكْ فَلَا مُرْسِلَ لَهُ مِن بَعْدِ وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ Whatever of mercy, any good, that Allah may grant to mankind, none can withhold it. And whatever He may withhold, none can grant it hereafter. And He is the one who is almighty, so no one can defeat His plan, no one can go against His plan, against His decision, and He is the one who is also all wise. So any decree, any command, any decision that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is backed up by a perfect wisdom. So it's not a random choice, it has a wisdom for things to happen at certain place and certain time with certain people. And likewise, وَمَا مِن دَابَّةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ إِلَّا عَلَى اللَّهِ رِزْقُهَا And there's no creature on this earth that, al- and that al- upon Allah is His sustenance. So if you remember what we were talking about earlier is that sometimes we kind of mix up things and we try to overburden ourselves with results that do not belong to us. What is upon us is the effort, the results are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we keep asking, oh, did I achieve the results? Did I achieve the results? That causes a lot of stress and anxiety. Rather, if we ask ourselves, did I do my part? It just changes the whole mindset, the whole bulk and the, the way you view the world. Because there are things that are in your hand and there are things that are not in your hand. So if you look and ask and connect your happiness with things that are not in your hand, it's going to be very hard to be happy. But if you connect it with things that you are able to do, like Allah is saying, so you ask, right? Did I ask? Am I consistent in my dua? Am I taking the steps? Am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? And so on and so forth. Then the third example, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the sins. And this is again in Surah Al-A'raf as well. Look, the dua of Adam alayhi salam, what is he saying? Rabbana bulamna anfusana. Right? So we have wronged ourselves. Again, going back to zulm. But what is he saying now? Wa illam taghfil lana. If you are not to forgive us, Right? And if you are not to have mercy on us, then we'll be from the losers. So this has now happened, a sin has happened, a mistake has happened. Now the servant is realizing that the only one that can forgive is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if Allah were not to forgive, then the person would be in loss. So this is very comprehensive and it's very well summarized by how Ibrahim alayhi salam talked to his people. So this shows us the mindset of Ibrahim alayhi salam and we can start working on getting that mindset, right? Look what he's telling his people. So he says, 
Um, so when he's describing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Alladhi khalaqani fahuwa yahdi. He's the one who created me and he's the one who will guide me. Right? Walladhi huwa yud'imuni wa yasqeen. So again, going back to similar to what the, uh, the Hadith Qudsi is saying, that he is the one who feeds me and the one who gives me uh, uh, drink. Right? Who, who quenches my thirst. And then, wa idha maridtu fahuwa yashfeen. If I fall sick, then he's the one who will cure me. وَالَّذِي يُمِيتُنِي ثُمَّ يُحْيِينَ And you know, he's the one who will cause me to die and then resurrect me. وَالَّذِي And then also the hope. وَالَّذِي أَطْمَعُ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ لِي خَطِيئَةِ يَوْمَ الدِّينَ And he's the one that I hope but will forgive my sins on the day of judgment. And then with this understanding, this mindset about his Lord, this faith, this iman, he makes a dua, رَبِّي حَبْلِ حُكْمًا وَأَلْحِقْنِي بِالصَّالِحِينَ so, so this is, for example, how they used to view and how they had the mindset and faith about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, as we know that a lot of pious predecessors, they used to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for everything. Right? Even for salt. Because they know that if Allah were not to facilitate getting salt for them, they would not have salt. And even for the fodder of their sheep. So basic things, basic necessities, they wouldn't take anything for granted. Such a person could be so grateful, right? So if you realize that everything is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you appreciate the, the small things in life, the water, the cold water, the air conditioning, the lighting, everything, you can become so happy, you'll be so amazingly grateful. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the action points that we should have from these things. So number one is for us to really realize that look, there are certain things in my hand is, and everything is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Now, with that mindset, you start your prayer, Allahu Akbar. Right? So yes, you have concerns that you already had before the prayers, right? You had to pay some bills or, you know, apply for some things, different tasks you have to do, email, this and that, all those things. But those are just means to get some success, right? Which is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when now you're in the state of prayer, this is not the time to plan what is need, what needs to be done and what's remaining and how to do it. Rather, to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do it for us. So if by chance things come and, oh, I have to email or whatever, I have to prepare this, I have to send this out, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for success in that matter. Rather than planning on how you will get what you want, just ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give it to you. Right? So you still have that concern, but now you are changing from acting and planning to asking. So this is the time of asking. So likewise, whenever a worry comes to your mind, right? Anything, any thought that causes us depression, anxiety, grief, as soon as it comes, so there's, if we don't intercept it, if we don't have a ritual for it, we'll go down in circles and we'll start thinking about all the bad possibilities that can happen, right? But if we were to stop that thought, say, okay, good. So this is a concern I have. That's fine. It's, it's natural to be concerned about, you know, my job or business or family or children or spouse okay but what I'm going to do is I'll ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for ease for success for guidance to fix that issue and prevent what am I whatever I'm being afraid of to prevent that from happening and I will take my measure so if you have an alternative a positive alternative to deal with bad thoughts or depressing thoughts that's going to be very much beneficial likewise when it comes to decision making a lot of people are, it's very hard for them to decide something right so you have a few options Again, you just follow the way that Allah's Messenger has taught us. Take a look at different options. You decide on something, you do the istikhara, and then you go with it, right? And then you don't have to keep worrying about, oh, maybe I made a wrong decision. Okay, now touching on the point of forgiveness, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness, there's other reports as well, in, as in uh, from Abu Hurairah radiallahu an, that the Messenger of Allah said, by Allah, I seek forgiveness of Allah and turn to Him in repentance more than 70 times a day. So again, right? It's anytime a worry comes to us, let's incorporate forgiveness in it too because that's a positive action that we can do, right? That's one of the things we can do to get closer to whatever we want to achieve and get away from whatever we want to run away from. So that's not a ritual. So think about, am I making enough forgiveness? Am I asking for enough forgiveness throughout the day? What is my routine around it? After salah, you know, dr during driving, so on and so forth. What's my own schedule for it? What, how can I, you know, be consistent on that? Now, 
from a different angle, when you understand this, that everybody is prone to misguidance and errors and mistakes, then you can also appreciate others when they fall short, right? So if somebody does not fulfill their promises, yes, you know, you will hold them accountable and all that sort of thing, but you can at least appreciate that, alhamdulillah, it's not me, it's them, and Allah saved me from making that error, from, from not fulfilling my promise, from breaking my promise, so on and so forth, and it's them, and alhamdulillah, Allah saved me. Were Allah not to save me, I would also be making the same type of mistake. So you can at least appreciate the bounty of Allah that you have, that you are not falling into the same uh, situation. So this is a very powerful hadith to remember, right? Especially, you know, to have hope, because it's very important to have the right balance of fear and hope. So it's narrated by the Prophet of Allah to, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that a man committed a sin and said, Oh Allah, I committed a sin, so forgive me. And Allah says, My servant, my slave knows that he has a Lord who forgives sins or punishes for them. So he, the slave knows that I have wronged myself by committing the sin and my Lord is able to forgive, he is also able to punish. Right? And with that belief, with that understanding of balance of fear and hope, he's asking for forgiveness. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I have forgiven the sin of my slave. So it is very important to realize that balance and to always be asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. And there are other verses like, you know, in Surah Ali Imran, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً أَوْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ ذَكَرُوا اللَّهَ فَاسْتَغْفَرُوا لِذُنُوبِهِمْ وَمَنْ يَكْفِرُوا الظُّنُوبَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ and, the, and Allah is praising the slaves who when they commit a fahisha or they wrong themselves, they remember Allah and they ask Allah for forgiveness from their sins. And who is it that forgives except Allah? Okay, now continuing on the hadith, uh, the hadith Qudsi, the original hadith that we were discussing. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that, O oh my servants, you can neither do me any harm nor can you do me any good. So this is also, you know, from the perspective of that, all this salah or fasting or any acts of obedience that we do for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we actually benefit from those results. And it's not something that, you know, uh, raises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His kingdom at all. And, and the part that we have is that, oh my servants, even if the first amongst you and the last amongst you and the whole of human race of yours and that of jinn, all of them were to become like the most pious among you. So they all had that heart of the most pious person. It will not increase Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his kingdom at all. Likewise, if the opposite were to be true, if everybody becomes the most wicked person, everyone's heart becomes like the heart of the most wicked one, it wouldn't decrease from the kingdom, the power, the authority of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, finally, on the point of uh, jealousy, Right? So the part of the hadith that's relevant to that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Oh my servants, even if the first amongst you and the last amongst you, all of you, right, the whole human race, the whole race of the jinns, they were all to get together and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whatever they want, right? And Allah were to give it all to them. Then it would not in any way cause any loss in the kingdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Other than what happens when you dip a needle in an ocean, right? The ocean is still there. So if you like something that a brother or sister has, you can just ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it. It's not just like one thing that, you know, if somebody has it, nobody else can have it. So if you like something, just ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no reason for us to be jealous from each other. Likewise, if you have something and somebody needs your consultation, your advice, there's no reason to hold it back because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has infinite resources. So if you give him advice and he also gets some of what you have, you are still going to get more from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is also from the perspective of that, look, everything is possible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not to lose hope whether it be a medical situation, right? So we may go to a doctor and the doctor may say this is not possible. That's based on their own statistics. That's based on their own research, right? It's not based on the infinite resources that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has. And for Allah to do something, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Yaseen, إِنَّمَا أَمْرُهُ إِذَا أَرَادَ شَيْئًا أَنْ يَقُولَ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُنْ 
Indeed, for the command of Allah, when Allah wants to do something, is that Allah says, be, and it becomes. Right? So this is very important for us to realize that when we are talking about the worldly resources, the worldly experts, they are talking based on their expertise and their own resources, but the resources with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are in finite. So never give up hope for that. So, okay. Let's talk about the last part of the hadith so that we finish in time, inshallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ibadi innama hiya a'malukum, uhsiha lakum, thumma ufikum iyaha, faman wajada khayran falyahmadillaha azza wa jal, waman wajada ghayra thalik falayalumanna illa nafsa. O my servant, these deeds of yours, the action, you sitting, you spending time in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fasting, you know, holding off your desires, you know, taking time out for prayers, reading Quran, doing dhikr, doing sadaqah, all these things, are really what matters, and this is what I count for you, I record for you, and then I will recompense you for that. So whoever finds good on that day, then let him praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and whoever finds other than that, then he has no one to blame except himself, right? And this is again reinforced in, uh, uh, in, in Quran, by when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, So even if you do a little speck of good deed, you will see the result. Right? And likewise, if you do a little speck of bad, you would see the result. So this is very important that nothing would go to waste. And a very interesting dialogue between Shaytan and his followers, that Shaytan would say, وَقَالَ الشَّيْطَانُ لَمَّا قُضِيَ الْأَمْرِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَعَدَكُمْ وَعَدَ الْحَقِّ وَوَعَدْتُكُمْ فَأَخْلَفْتُكُمْ وَمَا كَانَ لِيَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ سُلْطَانٍ إِلَّا أَنْ دَعُوتُكُمْ فَاسْتَجَبْتُمْ لِي Right? So he'll say that, look, Allah made a promise to you, and I also made a promise to you, and you followed me, right? I did not have any authority over you, so now it's not the day for you to blame me, right? The only person that you should be blaming is yourself. Okay, so I'd like to summarize all the discussion, but most importantly, the, the point that I had earlier is that of, you know, having a ritual, meaning that, when you have a headache and you use medicine, you know which medicine to go to, right? Likewise, if you use Quran to treat yourself, you know what you need to be reciting on yourself, right? Now, when it comes to our mental and emotional exhaustions, this is sometimes happening because of some wrong understanding or fear that we have, which is corrected and straightened when we go back to the Quran and Sunnah. So we need to have those type of texts ready to feed us whenever we are going into that negative uh, spectrum uh, of thoughts and emotions. But to summarize, we started talking about wool and we saw that how it's a wide variety of area that it covers and why it's important for us to check in all those areas that we are not wronging firstly ourselves as well as not wronging other people. And we saw that there are different ways of wronging other people and if we do wrong other people, then the penalties in the hereafter are much bigger. So the way to avoid that is to ask yourself, am I wronging anyone or not? And to also ask other people that we deal with that we are responsible for. Another thing connected to that was our thoughts about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to have positive thoughts about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that if I do the right thing, Allah will not put them to waste. If I give up something for Allah, if I worship Allah, if I do the right things, Allah will provide me, Allah will aid me, Allah will support me, and so on and so forth. And likewise, we talked about uh, the notion of the notion of who owns everything, that everything that we want is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we are only to put in the effort to get there. So if we are only thinking about results, which we don't own, we would not be happy. Rather, we should be focusing on the journey. So there's three, three elements that I think we should be considering. One is the destination. The destination is Jannah, right? So that's something to rejoice and something to check for. Am I making efforts to go to Jannah? Okay, then it's the journey. So you could be sleeping during, during the journey, you could not be driving, you could not be taking any action, and if that's the case, then we are blameworthy. But if we are driving, if we are taking the action, if we are on the right road and not on the wrong road, then alhamdulillah, then I can be happy for that and I can celebrate that win. The, the third thing are the rest stops. So when you are taking a journey, you take a break at Tim Hortons or at a restaurant or a coffee shop, those are the rest stops. You're not having a journey for that. 
Those are just resting spots that you collect. So for example, in this worldly life, you're making effort to earn halal sustenance. You're making effort. That effort is taking you to Jannah. The rest stop would be that you get a good job. You have success in your business. Even that rest stop does not come, it does not mean that you're not doing the right thing because that rest stop's coming or not is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we saw in the hadith. Right, then we talked about infinite resources, competition, helping each other, uh, decision making and so on and so forth. So inshallah we'll end here and we only have five minutes almost before the adhan. So subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik, ashadu an la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Is that my year?